Well, good morning. I'm Martin Tyner with the Enoch Wildlife Rescue, and, and most of you know my dear friend here. This is Scout, my golden eagle. And we're going to just spend the day today talking a little bit about uh, Scout's history and my history and my, you know, you know how we were able to, to have a golden eagle legally in, in North America and, and those kinds of things. So, guys, if you have questions, uh, uh, please send them in, and I'll be more than happy to answer uh, all of your questions on this somewhat complex topic. Uh, DG, should we go for our, our number question today? You know what? The first thing we got here is we got a, a message from TN and he or she says, good morning. I may miss this episode because I need to go to the post office before it closes at noon. Time is now 9.55 EST. Your vlog starts 11 a.m. here. God bless. Peace and love. Well, well, thank you for, for the note. And, uh, and, you know, you can always just, you know, watch it on the YouTube. So there, there's, there's no problem with that. So, and uh, wonderful to, to have you drop in. Okay, so we're ready for your number? Yes, let's get our number question. Kind of getting a little thin on the numbers here. Number 23 for the 23rd of Dece December, and we have on the new owl name. So let's see what we got here. Wishing all the best to the entire crew. I would like to suggest the name Bowie for the little owl joining the wildlife ambassadors. David Bowie had a permanently dilated eye, and in the movie Labyrinth, where he played the Goblin King, he turned into a barn owl. Not the same kind of owl as a new screech owl, but still an owl. Thank you for all that you do, Crafty Dragon. Well, thank you, Crafty Dragon. Actually, that's a pretty cool name. I like that. Um, and, and so we'll we'll certainly add it to the list. You know, I am I'm not the final word as to uh, to the name. We'll we'll bounce it off a lot of of our board members and volunteers and those kinds of things. Uh, but yeah, I think that's 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 a pretty cool suggestion. Uh, so thank you for sending it in. And we got a good morning from Alora. Good morning from Boulder. Oh, uh, well, hello, Alora. And, you know, we, uh, I've only been to Boulder once. And, uh, you know, I, Boulder's a beautiful little town. Uh, sh I shouldn't say little compared to what I'm used to. But uh, um, we, we, we went to Boulder uh, to do a, a, a radio interview uh, for a PBS station in, in Boulder. And, um, they, they gave me a, uh, kind, kind of an award for wildlife rescue and wildlife education. And so it was a, it was a fun trip to, to get there. That's the first time I've, I've been to that area. And so it was look, looked around as we were driving going, you know, that would be a really good place to fly an eagle. And that would be a really good place to fly an eagle. And look at those, those ponds, and that would be great for, for flying my falcon. And so Boulder has uh, uh, some topography that would just be wonderful um, for falconry and for working with these birds. So, but uh, thanks for popping in. And we got a couple messages from Sherry. Hi, Martin, Scout, and Chat. And Scout is gorgeous. He is a pretty boy. You know, he's, he really is, um, you know, the, the, the nice thing about Scout is, like I said, he's, he's with me, you know, he, he has, you know, all of the benefits of a captive life where he has his, his muse, which is his house that he lives in and he's protected from the wind and the rain and all of that kind of stuff. And, uh, also from the sun, um, you know, these dark brown feathers in, um, you know, in the sun uh, actually bleach the feathers a little bit. So a lot of the wild eagles, they look a, a little bit lighter in color. In fact, you can see on his wing here, this, this light area right, th right down through here. Um, most of the eagles that I rescue are that color across their entire body because, of this, because it gets bleached in the sun, um, which because he's a little bit darker, it really shows off his golden hackles, the feathers on the back of the head here, where the golden eagle gets his name, golden eagle from those feathers. So yeah, he's a pretty boy. And uh, 
more important than that, he's just he's just a sweetheart to work with. So I heard you boys had a little drama this morning before the show. Well, it's 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 nothing unusual. Um, Scout has a bit of a habit. He doesn't do this all the time, but he has a bit of a habit. You know, I can walk out and and like I did this morning and check on him and make sure that everything's good and then come back in the house and get things set up for our little program or in the case of traveling to do an educational program, walk back in and get things loaded in the car, get ready to go. And then I walk out and to get Scout only to discover that he decided that he was going to cut his Jesse off. And, you know, th this is this is really stout stuff. This is buffalo hide. And he can literally reach down there with his razor sharp beak and just cut it right off. And he does that to, as a joke more than anything else. And so, it, you know, it, it seems like he knows when we're going to go do a, do a show. And not all the time, but every once in a while he decides, oh, I'm going to I'm going to make uh, Martin's life a little more difficult and I'm going to cut off one or both of my Jesse's so that he has to panic and he has to run in the house, go downstairs, cut a new pair of, of Jesse's, you know, get a, get them measured, get them cut, get them the whole punches, get every, get them um, sealed up uh, and then and then basically um, put them on by myself. Now, like I said, he, he's a big guy. He's extremely powerful. Those feet are extremely powerful. And I have to grab him and, and put him down. In this case, yeah, I had him in here on, in the living room in his box. As so I had to grab him out of the box, put him down on the floor, hold him down, uh, lace a, a new Jess on for him, and, and then basically get up and, and apologize profusely. You know, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, I didn't want to grab you, but I had to get that on real fast. Uh, and so it's it's just one of his little tricks that he likes to pull, uh, just just to make make life a little more interesting. I'm a big guy. And so you did say you needed a little extra chill time with him today before the show too, because of that. Well, yeah, I want I wanted to ba basically bring him out and just sit here, and, and again just just uh, continue to apologize and and continue to to basically tell him how much I love him and what a dear friend he is. And, and, uh, you know, he's, you know, he's, he's a sweetheart. He doesn't hold a grudge with me. He, he, uh, holds a grudge with everybody else, but he doesn't hold a grudge with me. He, uh, I, I think he's smart enough to know that it was his fault because he did it, but he's never going to admit that. So shall we, uh, roll the baby pictures of Scout that we found or? Yeah, we're, we're going back into the archives. And uh, so th this is uh, one of the very, very first times that Scout and, and I were out um, and going, going to hunt rabbits. That's the rabbit he caught. No, leave the buttons alone, Scout. And so we do butcher them out in the field quite frequently and, you know, leave uh, um, the parts, uh, the messy parts out there for the scavengers, for the foxes and the coyotes and, and the smaller birds of prey to, to feed on. And so we're out here in the, in the Parowan Gap area with him and and this particular video was uh, uh, shot by a um, a gal that was just kind of visiting and so she sh shot this video like I said most of the time when, when we're out in the field it's just kind of scouting me but this was before he got offended by a photographer so he wasn't he was what I would consider dangerous to strangers uh, so anyway That you can see his eyes are brown. You know, he's a three-year-old right there and not a full adult. So yeah, this is this is my baby. A 
let him have some of his lunch from the rabbit that he caught. He's such a big boy. You were just a kid then, huh? So what are some of the, the key differences between Baby Scout and Mature Scout? Uh, Baby Scout had more white in his tail feathers. Um, and and Baby Scouts, his, their eyes uh, for the first, oh, four to five years, the eyes are brown. And so the younger they are, the darker brown they are, and they get lighter and lighter. And by the time they're five, their eyes are yellow like Scout's eyes are now. And that's, you know, around the the eye here. And so you, you see those those pretty ye yellow eyes on his, on him there. You know, that's that's certainly a, a sign of, of a fully mature or what we call sexually mature golden eagle. M127 says Scout and Martin both looking so young. Well, that was that was uh, 17 years ago. 2006. 2006. So don't ask me to that? do math. I'm a web geek. So that that's actually. Yeah, something like that. But anyway, you know, he, he and I've been together uh, for, for 17 years. And, and uh, he's uh, uh, 20. I think he'll be 21 years old this spring. So. As a wild eagle goes, the average life expectancy, if all goes well in the wild, is 20 years. And so as wild eagles go, he's an old man. But in captivity, um, we can as much as triple that. And so there's, there's a very good chance he'll, he'll live into his uh, 50s and 60s. Um, because of the, again, his captive life is, is so much safer. He doesn't have all the threats that a wild bird of prey has. So Martin, uh, what's with the whistle and something in your pocket there? Well, you told me it's DG <laughs> Spawn. Um, this is, this is Scout's whistle. And, and I use this for Scout and I use this for the other birds as well. And, um, so when he's on my glove, he sees that as quite the toy to play with, or when, when he's on my glove and I have this around my neck. And so I put that on so he has a toy to play with. And, you know, I've told the story many times, you know, I used to wear glasses. And when I wore glasses uh, until I had my cataract surgery, um, when I would do my, my educational programs, I take the glasses off uh, to, to visit with the audience and stick them in my pocket right here. I can get it get them to come out you know so these are just just reading glasses nothing special and and so uh scout uh while i'm doing the the programs one of his favorite things to do was to grab the glasses and throw them out to the audience just to, just to tease me and he also likes to pull the buttons off my shirt and so it's not uncommon for me to come home after a show missing a button or two uh and it's just it's just him being uh playful and silly. So I, I told DG that I'd put a pair of glasses in my pocket and put the whistle on. Uh, not, not saying that he will play with these things, but gives him something that if he wants to play with them, he can. I'm a big guy. So, um, like I said, if you guys have questions, please send them in. I'm just going to kind of ramble on, on, on my, uh, the story of me becoming an Eagle Falconer. And so, you know, the, the first thing that you have to realize, and, you know, everybody, everybody knows this, it, it was against the law to have an eagle for falconry. You know, it was, um, you could have hawks and falcons as long as you were licensed and so on. Uh, eagles, even though the, the laws in, 
rules and regulations were in effect, um, there was virtually no way for, for someone to meet the requirements. And, and ever since I was really quite young, you know, I, I had obviously a fascination with the birds of prey, but the golden eagle has certainly been um, one, of the, one of the most um, impressive animals to me. And, and I've always wanted to not just rescue and release them back to the wild, but I wanted the opportunity uh, to uh, practice eagle falconry where I, I have the, a chance to develop a, a friendship or relationship with a magnificent golden eagle like scout and um so anyway i uh, i wrote the uh, u.s fish and wildlife service and says you know i would really like to do this and i can see in the regulations that it is possible and um and also wrote uh the uh, utah division of wildlife resources that's what they called themselves back then and and said the same thing and you know, after a couple, three weeks, I got a letter back saying, no, uh, you know, that, um, that I, I am not, I don't fit the requirements. And so I would write them back to give me a clarification on the requirements to do this. And a few weeks later, they'd send me a letter back and saying, you know, here are the requirements. And then I would write back to them and say, well, you know, I, I do meet all of these requirements. And they would they would give me another excuse why I don't qualify, and then I'd write them back, and they would say no, and I'd ask for a justification, and it took four years. It took took four years of communicating with the federal government. The rules were there, um, at least from from the federal standpoint. Uh, Utah, it was just against the law. Period, and there was no way without me changing Utah law that I could do this. And, and so I, I uh, kept it up and kept it up. And after four years, um, the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service ran out of excuses. And they, they just couldn't justify not giving me an Eagle Falconry permit. And, and so once I had the the Eagle Falcon permit, and back then, it was a lifetime permit. Basically, it, as long as you are a master falconer, you get a second certificate, basically stating that that you are a qualified Eagle Falconer as well. And and so, um, they sent me my permit. Now I had to go to, to battle with Utah. And like I said, in Utah, it said right on the state regulations that uh, golden bald eagles are prohibited from being used in falconry. So I had to change Utah law. And so in the process of doing that, you know, I um, sat down with each member of the wildlife board, who actually is a, a citizen group that's appointed by the governor that basically are the people that write the rules or actually that approve the rules and regulations. Uh, the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources writes the rules and regulations, presents them to the wildlife board, and then there's public input as to whether the public agrees or disagrees. And, and so it was a very, very long process to do this. And, and so in the process of sitting down with um, the wildlife board members individually and in explaining what Eagle Falconry was and explaining the processes that we'd have to use and that I now have a certificate in my hand, um, you know, permitting me to be an Eagle Falconer and to train and fly Eagles for falconry, you know, that, that there really is no justification not to change the law. <clears throat> so finally we went to, to um, the final meeting uh, with the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources um, uh, biologists and a few other members of the division and, and myself. And the division got up and they made their presentation to the Wildlife Board why eagles, eagles are, are far too dangerous to work and that the general public would never accept anybody 
in North America, you know, having an eagle in captivity and using the eagle as a falconry bird and using the eagle as an educational animal. <clears throat> and, and that since there's no justification um, nationwide to do this and that they sh that uh, the, the Wildlife Board should deny my request to rewrite the rules and regulations for falconry to include eagles. And so it, again, it was a long process. And then I got up and I, and I sat down with, uh, and made my presentation and told them that the, uh, the eagle, especially the golden eagle has been used in falconry for thousands of years. It is practiced uh, in many countries around the world. The most famous are the Mongolians uh, that use eagles for falconry. <laughs> Um, in all of the places that eagles have been used for falconry, you know, I've never been able to find one death from an eagle attacking, so, uh, a falconry eagle attacking someone. Uh, so as far as the danger thing goes, you know, I can walk across the street, it'd be in more danger than working with an eagle. And, uh, and just basically gave my pitch to, to the wildlife board. And at the end of my little presentation, the wildlife board voted. And the Wildlife Board voted to legalize the use of eagles for falconry within the state of Utah and mandated the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources to write regulations governing the use of eagles for falconry so that it would be legal and do it with my participation and to my approval. And so basically I wrote the original uh, rules and regulations governing the use of, of eagles for falconry in the state of Utah. And, and so it was a long process. And then once all of that was done, now I have to jump the next hurdle. And the next hurdle is it's now legal to use an eagle for falconry, but there's only two ways that you can legally acquire an eagle for falconry in North America. And that is that the federal government gives you one. Let's say there's a young eagle that's been stolen from its nest. It's been uh, imprinted by humans. Uh, an imprint bird of prey can be extremely dangerous to work with. It can't be released back to the wild because it could actually harm, harm people. And so that bird can be given to a falconer for falconry. Uh, and the other way to acquire an eagle for falconry is to trap a full grown wild eagle that a farmer feels is a threat to his livestock. And, and so, you know, there are still farmers, even to this day, there are still farmers that believe that eagles swoop down, carry off sheep, cows, and children. And of course, that's, that's obviously not true. Um, you know, I have, a, I have a neighbor here that, uh, you know, he's been a sheep rancher his whole life, and he still runs uh, uh, she, sheep and cattle. And, um, you know, he's told me on, on a number of occasions that, that my golden eagle is just faking it. That my golden eagle at some point in time is going to grab a hold of me and fly off with me and, and, and kill me. And he truly believes that this eight pound creature can fly off with me. And the truth of the matter is that uh, a golden eagle such as this one that weighs about eight pounds they can carry about two and a half pounds of weight into flight. Uh, and so they, they can't even carry a full grown jackrabbit into flight, let alone a, a human being or a cow or a sheep or whatever. Uh, and so they're primarily a scavenger. And so what happens is a farmer sees, you know, gets out to his fields in the morning and eagles eating on a dead lamb. The farmer assumes the eagle killed the lamb and the farmer wants the eagle dead. Uh, and so I have to find that situation. And so here in the state of Utah, I've, I've worked with a lot of the, the farmers in, uh, around southern Utah, helping them with um, oh different uh, wildlife issues kinds of things. So I know a lot of the guys that are farming around here. And I had one farmer in particular uh, out south of here that, uh, you know, ran during the lambing season. You know, he's the eagles are coming down and they're, they're coming down to eat the afterbirth or they're coming around to eat the stillborn lambs or those kinds of things. But he, he swears that the eagles are killing the sheep. And um, so I have to convince the farmer, first of all, please 
do not shoot the eagle. I am going to get state and federal permits that allows me to go and trap that eagle. And uh, so the farmer was a, a little bit unhappy with that, but he was willing to give me a chance. And so basically now I have to um, contact uh, the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources and get their permission, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and get their permission, and the Department of Agriculture and get their permission. So now I've got to get three government agencies to agree on the same thing at the same time. Quick enough that I could save the eagle's life. And so, you know, letters and um, phone calls constantly um, trying to move this through the process. And it's a very slow process. But because, you know, I'm the first one in Utah that was licensed to do this, I'm the first one. And I then, and so everybody, I think, just got sick and tired of putting up with me. And so finally, everybody said yes. But I had to have uh, a government agent, uh, what they call uh, animal damage control agent, which is Department of Agriculture employee that assists farmers in, in um, depredation issues like coyotes and cougars and those kinds of things. And so I had to have an uh, uh, animal damage control officer with me when I trapped the eagle. And um, so finally, all, all of my permits come in. Um, I've only got like two weeks that I can, that I can do this. And uh, so I'm, I set up the trap station. I'm out there from before sunrise to sunset uh, using um, uh, a, a dead lamb carcass that the farmer provided for me for the eagle to, as bait to trap the eagle. And um, so finally, after a few days, uh, the eagle in question, you know, first thing in the morning at sunrise, I saw the eagle sitting up on the power pole uh, near the trap station. And, and I parked about a mile away. And, and the, the poor guy, the Animal, animal damage control officers in my truck and we're parked about a mile away and I'm watching through my binoculars and he's bored stiff because he's been with me for several days now just sitting in the, in the car because he had to be with me when I trapped the bird and, and so you know I watched the eagle fly down to the trap station and I'm watching very very carefully and I see the eagle jump and I'm going, did we get him? Did we get him? Oh my God, did, did we get him? And then I see the eagle try to fly away and went about 10 feet and, and, let, and hit the ground. He couldn't fly away. The, the weight that I used on the trap that I caught him with was two and a half pounds. And the reason I put a two and a half pound trap on the, or weight on the trap was so that he could drag it around but couldn't fly with it. And so a two and a half pound weight, he couldn't get off the ground. And I saw him go to the ground. I'm going, oh, my God, I've caught my eagle. And I start up my pickup truck, and I stomp on the accelerator, and I go racing down this dirt road as fast as my old pickup truck would go. Animal damage control officer uh, wasn't sure that he was going to survive the, the bumpy, rutted out road getting down to, uh, uh, down to the field where the eagle is. And somehow, I, I don't even remember how, Somehow I jumped a barbed wire fence that's about more than four feet high, uh, and I just flew over it, and I ran about 200 yards across the open field and tackled my eagle. And got him, got him down, got him controlled, got his feet, and I was shaking. I was, I was shaking with, with excitement that this, that I caught, that I actually caught a, a, a wild golden eagle and it's the first time 
that anybody has legally, now let's qualify that legally, um, been allowed to trap a full-grown wild eagle for falconry in North America. It's been done before, please understand, I mean, people have trapped things illegally and trapped things without permits and those kinds of things. But this is the first time that a, a licensed eagle falconer with all the proper permits was able to trap a wild eagle for falconry. And so I've got my eagle and I've got it in my arms. And like I said, I'm shaking and I'm walking back to the truck. Um, and then the next problem is how do I get over the barbed wire fence? Because I don't have the adrenaline anymore. And I have to basically push the barbed wire around so I can kind of squeeze through and get the eagle through without the eagle getting caught. And I put a hood on the eagle's head to help calm it down, put the eagle in, in my big transport box, and we head for home. Uh, and um, the picture that you see a little bit, that picture right there, that is that eagle. That is, that is my golden eagle named Bud. And that's the eagle that I trapped uh, for, for falconry to legally be able to do that. And that painting was done by one of my students and very kind of him to have done that for me. So keep it on the plastic, sir. Thank you. That was very polite. Yes, it was. Did you see any buttons in that poo-poo he just laid? <laughs> no, no buttons. In the he hasn't taken any buttons off my shirt shirt in, in a while, so no buttons. So anyway, that's how Bud and I got acquainted. Um, once I got home, I put the, the, the leather straps on, called Jesse's, and I already had a, a, a unfinished room in my basement, kind of all cleaned out. I had a, I had a, a comfortable chair down there. I had a little itty bitty tiny television down there on a table. And I am going to perform a falconer's wake. Now what a falconer's wake is, simply put, you stay awake. Basically, the whole idea of a falconer's wake is you want to go through with your new wild friend all of its stress and all of its fear, and you want to overcome that as quickly as you possibly can. So you find a nice quiet place with the lights down low. The only, in fact, the only light is coming from the, from the little t TV across the room. And, and we sit there, and Bud is on my glove. I remove his hood. So he has to look at my ugly face, but it's a little bit dark, so it's not quite as bad. And he's sitting right here, this close. And I've got food on my glove for him. And I'm talking to him calmly and stroking him gently. And he's, he's pretty terrified. And, and I'm trying to soothe him to get him to understand that I'm a really nice guy and I've got food for you. And, and you and I are going to be dear friends. And so we sit there. And, you know, my wife comes home from work and I tell her, you know, it's, you know, I'm not going to be at work for at least two or three days, you know, just schedule around me. And by, by the way, you know, if you can fix me any, any little snacks or something, I would appreciate it because he's going to stay here on my glove and he's going to be on my glove 24 hours a day, seven days a week until he starts to eat off my glove. And once he starts to eat, he will have overcome a great deal of his fear of me, that he'll feel confident enough to bend down and, and to just like he's doing now, bend down and then reach and grab food off my glove. And that's, a, that's a, a, a de developing a great deal of trust because he's not looking at my face, you know, terrified and wanting to rip my nose off. Now he's starting to settle down. Now, I sat with Bud um, all day. We trapped him in the morning. I sat with him all day long on my glove. I sat with him 
all night long on my glove, just quietly soothing him and letting him know that I'm a nice person and we're going to be good friends. I sat with Bud for three days and three nights. Um, you know, coming upstairs to use the restroom was a bit of a chore, uh, but I could slide the hood over his head and we could come up and use the restroom. But he stayed right here. Um, but I had to stay awake for that whole time. Uh, after three days and three nights, uh, Bud finally reached down and started to eat. And as he started to eat, you know, I could feel he's coming he's getting calmer he's getting calmer and there's I, there's no more stress in his feet and he's starting to relax and that was one of the greatest experiences of my life to to go through a traditional falconer's wake um i've done that with hawks and falcons but to do that with an eagle was was truly an amazing experience so once he settles down, he goes out to his house, his chamber, it's called a muse, uh, where he is free loft. He can fly back and forth in, in his chamber. And then my job is to go out there several times a day with food. And I walk out there and I have food on my glove and I hand him food and I'll see if I can very, very gently pick him up and coax him and let him eat and and um, just spend time with him. And then after a few days, we're kind of walking around the yard, walking across the street to get the mail. And I've always got food for him because the way to an eagle's heart is through his stomach. Are we still there, DG? As far as I know, we're still here. Okay, I just you... saw the, the video is, is getting a little jerky. Okay, I, I think we're still good. Okay, good. So anyway, um, after a little more than a month of Bud and I uh, working together in captivity, the scariest day on, of my entire life comes to pass. It's now time to take him out on the desert, uh, take the equipment off. He is now free. He can fly away if he would like to. Again, I don't own these animals. They have the right to leave. And so after a little more than a month, like I've done many times before, I said, I'm on a fence post. I walk about 10 feet away, blow my whistle, because that's the dinner bell. Now that's your dinner bell, huh, baby? Um, and just like with a, a leash on him, my eagle flies from the fence post to my glove without hesitation. And now we start going for these wonderful, wonderful evening walks where it's cool and it's calm and it's quiet and the sun's getting ready to set. It's quite beautiful out there. And we go for these walks out through the desert and we extend the distance farther and farther and farther. So he's flying further and further. And, um, and we, we have this amazing experience working um, with this completely wild animal that trusts me enough to stay with me. And uh, then we, we kind of move the location to a place where there are rabbits and where there's uh, um, some cliffs that he can go up on the cliffs and get some altitude and he can soar the ledges and, and start to fly more like an eagle. And then, and so he goes up on the cliffs, soars around. I walk out through the desert, hitting bushes, flushing out rabbits. He starts to see me as a good dog, but I'm doing my job and flushing out rabbits for him. And he's keeping me in sight, watching. And he's, he's now chasing rabbits. And then he finally catches a rabbit. And um, catches the rabbit, kills it instantly with these big, powerful feet. That's no problem whatsoever. And um, we're done. I, I, I now have a completely wild golden eagle that is a game hawk trained in falconry. And so that's how 
or Bud and I became best friends, and this is how I became an Eagle Falconer. Anybody got any questions out there? Yeah, we got quite a few comments and questions if you're ready to roll, but uh, will yeah. Scout get too hungry, or can we stay on a little longer? Oh, we can stay on longer. Okay. So let's see here from Dark Angel. Good morning. I know you keep saying that wild eagles live around 20 years. I don't doubt that, but the bald eagles in Fort Myers, Florida, Ozzy was estimated at close to 30 years, and so was Harriet. She has another, he or she has another comment. So they can live longer. I've also read that if they reach 40, they have to go through dramatic changes to break their beak or they die. Well, for, first and foremost, uh, the 20 years, what we consider average, the average life expectancy. Can they go 30, 40 years in the wild if, or, or even 50 or 60 years in the wild? It is possible as long as there is uh, really a, a good habitat and good food sources and those kinds of things that without too much, you know, human interference and stress, they, they can just like in captivity, you know, they can live as much as 50 to 60 years, which is not uncommon for an eagle in captivity. And so their life expectancy can be that, but on average, the 20 years kind of the average mark. So if you find a 25 year old eagle, you know, wonderful, they, they had, it's had a good long life. Now, as far as when they turn 40, they go through uh, a dramatic change. That is 100% false. That is an old wives' tale that's been passed down from generation to generation. Eagles do not go through some kind of metamorphosis. Um, eagles, basically, uh, that from their first year on, they, they grow new feathers. Now, what that basically means is they lose some of their juvenile feathers and grow new ones to replace. Because feathers are delicate, they get broken. And every broken feather means their flight quality gets a little bit less. And so in, or, in order to repair those feathers, they just drop the old ones, grow new ones. And that's called a molt. Now, a golden eagle, um, to go through a full molt, molt can take about five years. So from the time it's uh, lost all of its juvenile feathers and grown all of its adult feathers, uh, can take a period of about five years. Um, a lot of the uh, really major flight feathers, like the wings and tail, uh, they will they will molt those every year. So, the you know the I you know I've I've heard that story where they have to break off their beak and break their talons off, and yeah, no, that's that's there's not a word of that that's true. Um, and I and I have like I said I've worked in in the zoological industry. And, and have worked with eagles that are, that are 30, 40, 50 years old. Um, and I can tell you for an absolute fact that that is not true. Okay. EZ says, I got my Healer of Angels book from you yesterday. Have Scout's autograph. Oh, well, well wonderful. I'm, I'm glad it, it's got to you. You know, Christmas is always a challenging time to get things shipped off, but um, yes. Um, if you purchase a book through our website, GoWildlife.org, uh, I will I will send you an autographed copy of my book, which which I will sign and my sweet wife Susan will sign and Scout will sign. We actually stamp in his footprint. Now, what what we've done so you understand is uh, many years ago uh, I basically put some food coloring on the bottom of Scout's foot and let him walk around on some paper. And then I picked the best footprint and I made a rubber stamp out of it. So it's his footprint and it's put on a rubber stamp. And so when we sign the books, I, I stamp Scout's actual footprint in the book. And, and so it's the only book in the world that you can get with uh, uh, an autograph from a wild eagle. And again, the profits from the sale of the book help us feed the sick, injured, and orphan wildlife that we care for. But I'm glad you got your book. M127 says, so in theory, could you fly bald eagles on the same permit? In theory, I could fly bald eagles on the same permit. Um, but here's the difference. 
bald eagles are primarily a scavenger and a fish eater. The, where a golden eagle is primarily a scavenger and a hunter. And so the golden eagle is far better suited for falconry than the bald eagle. You know, you know, this is a this is a big animal. You know, he weighs. You know, he he only weighs eight pounds, but he's a massive, massive bird. And you know, compared to flying uh, a Harris hawk or a falcon or a goshawk or or anything along those lines, this is a tremendous amount of work. Just just with a male, females are a third bigger. And so to get a bald eagle, which is even a little bit larger, uh, and try to work it and fly it for falconry, your success ratio, the bigger the bird, the lower your success ratio goes. And so if you wish to practice falconry, which is a hunting sport, and you want to go out and catch rabbits and those kinds of things, a bald eagle does not lend itself well, um, or not nearly as well, let's put it that way, as, as a golden eagle would. And so, um, theoretically, you you could, but then my question is, why? When when this is a, a much better candidate? D seventy six says it should be against federal law to shoot eagles unless you get a special permit, in which case a certified hunter does the job. It is against the law to shoot eagles. It's against the law to harass them in any way, shape, fashion, or form. But if you are a farmer, um, you can put, and you feel that there's an eagle that's a threat to your livestock, you can get a permit to shoot an eagle. It is possible. Um, but um, in my situation, um, the farmer was, goes to the Department of Agriculture to get permission to shoot the eagle. The Department of Agriculture notifies the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that they want to issue a permit for a farmer to shoot an eagle. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service contacted me, says we've got an eagle up in Wyoming, or in this case, Utah, that has, that, um, with Bud, now Scout we got out of Wyoming, but, um, and, um, and so a qualified licensed eagle falconer can go and rescue that bird uh, and so it's kind of the best of both worlds but the promise is that the eagle never returns back to the wild the eagle has has to because they, these guys are hardwired to return to where they learned to fly and so they will go back to where the problem was if you just if you trap one and you take it 500 miles away you turn it loose the truth of the matter it'll beat you back that it'll, it'll get home before you will. And, and so having them uh, bonded to a falconer um, allows the bird to fly free and to hunt and to be an eagle and, and yet not return to where it learned to fly. Okay, Cheryl says, hello, sir. Do you know what happened to Harriet the Eagle from the SWFL Eagle live cam? He disappeared a few years ago and never been seen again. I do not. Um, and I'll, I'll be really honest with you guys. You know, I, I don't follow the, the Eagle cams. Um, you know, the, probably the, the, the biggest difference is um, I see eagles every day. I see them in the wild every day. I have uh, several uh, eagle nest sites that I, that I monitor with a, with a spotting scope from great distances. Um, and so to, to sit there on a computer and watch an Eagle cam, just, it would be boring for me, if that makes any sense. And, and I know, you know, I'm one of very few people on the planet that, that has the opportunity to socialize with these guys regularly. And so I, I understand the attraction of the Eagle cams, but uh, I do get, uh, you know, letters and emails and phone calls and all those kinds of things every year from people that are monitoring, monitoring the Eagle cams and something isn't right. Uh, the, uh, the, the one in Florida last year, I think had some fishing line uh, on its foot and, and, I, and it probably got 30, 40, 50 um, 
emails and letters and phone calls, you got to come to, to Florida, you got to rescue this eagle. And to be honest with you, I can't do that legally. Um, that has to be done by the Florida Fish and Game and the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Florida. Um, and, and so, you know, I can't go step on somebody else's toes. Um, so I, you know, e even to, um, you know, have my wildlife rescue center here and, and I get, you know, animals brought to me from Northern Arizona and Nevada and, and have had them brought in from Arizona and Colorado as well. But in order to do that, you have to have both um, the state of origin, let's say Nevada, for example, has to has to approve, and the and the the and Utah has to approve, and it has to be brought in by um, by a, a game warden or Fish and Wildlife Service agent across state lines. So there's there's just a lot of rules and regulations that I have to abide by. And I, and I know a lot of people say, well, you know, but it's the life of, of these birds and you've got to go save them. But if I break the rules, if I break the law, I lose my permits and then I can't save anybody. And so I have to be very, very careful to cross my T's, to dot my I's, to, uh, to make sure that we do everything as legal as, as absolutely possible so that we can continue um, doing our wildlife rescue work. Ron asks, is a golden eagle bigger and more powerful than a bald eagle? No, actually, well, qualify just a little bit. Um, bald eagles, generally speaking, are slightly larger than goldens. But the southern raging bald eagles, the ones that we find in, in Arizona and Louisiana and Florida and those kinds of things, they, they tend to be a little smaller than the northern bald eagles. Uh, and so... You know, the northern ones uh, and the northern ones come here. Um, I see bald eagles right now, er, you know, every day because this is the time of year when the bald eagles migrate down into southern Utah from Florida or from uh, uh, Montana and, and Alaska and so on and so forth. And, and so these are always a little bit larger than our native goldens. Um, but if, if I had a, a bald eagle come up from the south, they could be very, very close to the same size. Jimmy says, all creatures are basically great and just want to lead a good life. Well, and that's, that's very, very true. And, you know, that's one of the things I try to get across in my programs is um, quality of life is far more important than quantity of life. And, and so... I can, I can guarantee that the scout here at any point in time could leave. He has that right to do so. Um, but he finds the relationship that he and I have to be beneficial to him. And, and so that's, that's why he's here. And to have that ability to provide such a high quality of, of life experience to a wild eagle is is amazing and and something that I've dreamed about ever since childhood. So that's why I, I, I adore falconry so much is it's one of very, very few relationships between man and wildlife that is mutually beneficial. That these animals do have the right to leave, but as long as they're happy with their lives and, and are happy exploiting us, like I said, he's my hunter, I'm his dog, then, then I, I feel very, very justified um, to, to have a golden eagle as, as one of my best friends. Terry says, Scout is such a good boy, he loves his dad. How much does he eat daily? Yes, he does love his dad. It's... Um, you know, like, like I said, I, I have this opportunity every morning when I get up, um, Scout will start his, he's got this very sweet, beautiful whistle and he'll, he'll whistle and whistle and whistle until I come in and walk into his chamber 
and he kind of fl flies over to one of those lower perches close to me where I can walk up and I can get nose to nose with him and kind of give him a hug and tell him he's a good boy. And, uh, and you know, he, he seeks friendship with me. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I put fresh water down and I give him food and, and, um, and then on the days that, that we go flying, you know, that we don't get, he doesn't get fed until, um, until we're out hunting. But, you know, eagles, especially the golden eagle, uh, if handled correctly, is by far one of the sweetest, gentlest, affectionate, and most intelligent animals on the planet. Uh, but if handled inappropriately, you know, this is an eight pound creature that will put you in the hospital on a regular basis. Uh, eagles, if handled inappropriately, can be quite dangerous. And, and so, you know, I tell people never offend your eagle. That's one of the first rules, huh, big guy? Oh, as far as the food, um, <laughs> yeah, he eats about a pound of animal a day. So a pound of rat, a pound of rabbit, a pound of quail, uh, you know, about a, about a pound is about his normal meal size. And it's not just meat, it's whole animal. So bones and fur and feather and all sorts of stuff like that. Sherry asks, how can you estimate how old an eagle is? You can estimate until they're about five years old. Um, uh, a, a young golden eagle and a bald eagle as well um, finish getting all of their adult feathers at at about age five. And, and so you can kind of look at them and, and see how much, for the golden eagle, how much white they've got in their tail. Um, you, because they lose the white in the tail by the time they're five. Uh, you can look at their eyes. And if the eyes are, are dark brown, then it's a, it's a young eagle. If they're yellow, uh, then, it's a, then it's more than five years old. And most golden eagles, their feathers their first set of feathers are very, very dark. They're almost black. And they, and they kind of get to more of, of the brown as, as they mature. And so with a little bit of uh, studying, you can kind of look at an eagle and say, that's a three-year-old. That one's a one-year-old. Yeah, that one's, that one's more than five, so I have no idea. And so once you get past five, it's, it's difficult to tell. Cat Toes asks, how often do you work with Scout to keep the connection? Every day, seven days a week. Uh, if if we're if he's not being being flown and hunted, um, we spend at, at least an hour every day um, where where he gets fed and we kind of hang out and he gets his bath and and you know uh, Scout and I travel doing you know school programs and Scout programs so he gets a lot of socialization that way as well. And so, yeah, uh, with all of these birds, um, in order to maintain the bond, you can't just put the bird away. Um, the falconry season is September through February, but after that, we're, we're not supposed to be hunting these birds anymore until next September. And so what that does is, you know, we don't have that, that particular routine, but we still have to maintain the bond between us. Uh, and like I said, through time and social, socialization and, and feeding, um, if you just put the bird in a chamber and throw food to it and then pick it up um, in September, you're, you're starting off with a wild bird that's developing all sorts of bad habits and, and it's going to be difficult. So it's very important to maintain that relationship. Sean says, you said that eagles that are trapped are promised never to return to the birthplace. How is that? Because you also said they have the right to leave at any time. That's true. That is absolutely true. Um, what we basically, if now Scout was, was from Wyoming and we had to trap him and promise he'd never go back to Wyoming. Um, basically through falconry techniques, he is bonded to me. He flies with me. He hunts with me, uh, and we have this relationship between he and I. Um, he does not feel driven to migrate, because he's got he has a great life with me. Uh, a good example of this is the courtship season is set is um, basically about mid January 
through February is, is when they go through the courtship, when they pick a mate um, and start nesting season and all that kind of stuff. Now, he does get to fly through the courtship season. And, you know, he and I have been together for 17 years. If he finds a pretty little lady eagle in a couple of weeks, January, a couple of weeks, if he finds a pretty little lady eagle that's cuter than I am, he will fly away and never, never come back because they pair bond to their mate. And, and so, like I said, I don't own him and he has the right to leave. And so if he finds a mate, he'll stay with her, which again, because he's pair bonded to her, he won't go back to Wyoming, if that makes any sense. And, and so the, the goal is to develop this friendship and partnership um, with these animals so that they want to stay with you. And I, I can't guarantee that he would never go back, but I'm going to do my darndest to make sure that we have a relationship so he doesn't want to go back. Now, again, if he finds a pretty little lady eagle that's cuter than I am, he'll pair bond with her and that's the end of it. He will never come back to me again, but he won't go to Wyoming. But like I said, he and I have been together for 17 years, which is just absolute proof that I'm adorable. So that's that's all we can do. Well, we're an hour in, Martin, but we do have a few more questions. So what do you think? Sure. I, I, I know this is a subject people have an interest in. So, yeah, let's go ahead and answer a few more. All right. Uh, Emily says he's trying to figure out who on earth you're talking to. Well, you, you know, he's he's pretty well used to um, you know, coming in the house and sitting and talking before in front of you guys with the, the camera on. Um, and, and I do talk to him a lot, uh, even if it's just he and I, and we're sitting out, um, uh, in the yard in a nice shady spot, you know, our, my conversation is, is with him and I, and, and I touch him gently and, and, and he just enjoys the, 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 the time that we spend together. And probably the most important thing is when I'm having a really, really bad day and as, and as a, a licensed wildlife rehabber, you have a lot of really bad days because you can put your heart and soul into rescuing something and they don't make it and, and it just breaks your heart. And so when I'm having a really bad day, um, the advantage that I have is I have Scout and I can, I can go into his chamber, pick him up, find a nice shady spot in the yard and, and sit down and work through my, my feelings, um, work through my grief. And I, I truly believe he, he understands um, when, I'm, when I'm sad and when I'm feeling bad because it, he's always the most gentle and most affectionate when I'm, when I'm hurting. And, and so, you know, I, I think he, he understands and he, 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 he helps to comfort me. Shrimp asks, do Helen, Scout, and Belle become jealous of your attention to the other? No, not really. And the reason they don't is because they, they don't uh, associate with each other. Um, ba basically, uh, the, the problem is that my my hawk and my falcon would kill each other and my eagle would find them both delicious and, and so they kind of see each other as something to kill and eat more so than competition chunky says how do you deal with keeping and using fallen feathers considering that golden eagles are a protected species i wouldn't want natives and feds angry at me well ba basically what we do is we just throw, throw them in a box. When I get a box full of feathers, they are shipped out to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Feather Lab, uh, where the feathers are then distributed to the Native Americans. And, um, and this goes for if, if uh, especially eagles come in that, that, are, that don't survive, that are just so severely injured that, that, that we, can't, we can't help them. Uh, we will freeze them and then again, ship them off to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service where all the parts and pieces can be uh, given to the Native Americans. I've got a, a, a partnership with um, 
the Southern Regional Office of the Division of Natural Resources here in, in Cedar City that uh, I, bring, I bring all the eagle parts and feathers and things to them. Um, and, and then they basically, when they get a, enough uh, to, to make a shipping worthwhile, then they'll ship it off for me. So yeah, I, I don't keep um, the eagle feathers. I can keep a few tail feathers and things for what we call imping to replace broken feathers. But I, I, um, I don't just keep eagle feathers, nor do I wear them in my hat or anything along those lines. That's, that's illegal. So we've got a couple more comments, but they're both kind of stories. So maybe we can uh, earmark those for tomorrow since Scott will be back again. And the two sure. stories are, are one about Teresa asked how Bud knocked you out. And then the other one from Shadow's Feather was wondering about the photographer story and how the photographer offended Scout. So maybe okay. we uh, save those for tomorrow since we'll have Scout back with us. We, we can certainly do that. And uh, you guys, uh, I guess we're going to close it off now. Or do we have any other questions? I think we could probably end for today. Okay. Well, guys, thank you for, uh, for joining us and for putting up with us. And uh, again, thank you um, for all of your, your generous donations um, for, for our Wildlife Rescue Center. And, and thank you again, uh, Finley Subaru and Subaru of America. I always have to thank those folks for their share of the love, which is going on right now. Um, so people buy a, a, a Subaru from Finley Subaru uh, here in St. George. Uh, they will make a, a $300 donation to our foundation. Uh, Rocky Mountain Power, thank you for, for the generous donation uh, this year. Uh, Eccles found it. So many of you, I just I couldn't go, keep going on with thanking everybody. There's just so many, but all, all of you folks that have been so kind and so generous, thank you for, for helping us do what we do. And uh, Scout, thank you too. He, he likes it when people, you know, order in. Oh, DG, thank you for the, for the donation for the rats and mice for, for Belle. She appreciates that to no end. Dude, what and are you doing reading Belle's mail? It came on my email. I have oh, to read it to her. Oh, all right, all so, right. So, so anyway, th thank you, um, everyone, for, for all of your kindness and generosity. Um, it, because of you guys, it, it keeps us doing what we do. So thank you. We'll talk to you guys again tomorrow.